Amen. Let's pray. We're going to get into this. I want to forewarn you that uh, as we're getting into this this morning, this is going to be introduction uh, to the book of Hebrews. There's going to be a lot of backdrop, a lot of information. I think it's very important that we do this in order to uh, rightly align ourselves for all of the wealth of revelation, all of the wealth of, of instruction that's going to come to us as we traverse through this entire book. There, there are so many layers of things that God wants to give us, but I think that it is it is important to, to lay the proper foundation. So we're going to go into the, the preliminary stages of the introduction into this particular letter before we start breaking down verse by verse. Let's get the context. Let's get some context in terms of this. So, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this season. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in us individually. We thank you for what you're doing in us collectively. We thank you for what you're doing in the body universally. Father, we thank you that we have a measure, Lord. There's a stewardship. There's a grace. There's a revelation in each one of our hearts and lives of the person of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that that revelation would grow so much more clearer, so much more brighter. And Father, we thank you that the entrance of your word brings light. It gives understanding unto the simple. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. We thank you that Jesus is the day star. Lord, may he illume, may, may, may the illumination of that star become so much brighter in our lives. And Father, we thank you that Jesus is pre preeminent over all things. He is superior over all things. Lord, that is, the, that is the primary message of this letter, the superiority of Jesus. May he become so supreme, Lord God. Uh, over every situation that confronts us in this life. May he be the one that calls the shots over every situation that confronts us in the life. May we look to him as the only source for, for wisdom, for understanding, for revelation, for instruction. May his voice become so much louder than all the other voices and all the other noise and all the other distractions in this life. May the voice of the son of the living God drown out in silence and make null and void every uh, uh, voice that is not relevant for this season of our lives. And Father, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus for what you will do and what you will say and how you are preparing us, Lord, for this very hour in Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Uh, I will, I will um, uh, throughout this week, send this outline out to you all so that you can have what I have. And then we'll begin to, after Father's Day, jump right into this now. I want to deal with the occasion, uh, really the backdrop of why this particular letter has been wrote. And in my study, I found out that uh, historically speaking it, is, speaking, it is ascribed to the Apostle Paul but as we begin to dig, we'll begin to see that there are possibly some other uh, uh, candidates who possibly have written this book. You'll see that it is not spoken of in the singular. There is a, there is a plurality of expression when you look at uh, the actual language in this book. And it is said that it is possible that Barnabas and Apollos are co-writers of this particular book using source material from the Apostle Paul uh, using the book of Galatians, because you'll see that the language of Galatians and the focuses of Galatians are very much similar to the book of Hebrews, an exception of the comparison of the priesthood, the ironic priesthood and the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So with that being said, let's dig into this. The occasion of this epistle may well be the influence of the Judaizers. Now we have to understand uh, the role of the Judaizers as it pertains to why Paul wrote Galatians, because in fact, the gospel of grace came through uh, the apostle Paul to the Gentiles and there were Jewish Christians being converted from Judaism to a life of following Christ as their king. And as a result, you had Jews who were persecuting Gentiles and saying to them, they must be circumcised, they must come back under the law. So it is the pretext for why this particular letter is also being written because it's a similar type of situation happening to these Jewish Christians who are finding themselves 
under two major pressures of that hour, the Jews and also the political power of Nero. So we'll begin to look at the influences of the backdrop of how these things uh, affected them and how it is in the 21st century, we have some similar external influences that could possibly affect us the same way. And so we had the influence of the Judaizers on the Jewish Christians whom Barnabas had to evangelize in the Valley of Lycus. These Judaizers had uh, mostly uh, certainly gained strength after the death of Paul. So they waited to rear their ugly head after Paul was literally taken off the scene, after Timothy was arrested. Uh, and, and so their influence basically began to impact all of these Christians, these Jewish Christians who were in Asia Minor, all right? And it is said that Barnabas also had churches that were largely Jewish. His gospel was the same as Paul's because Barnabas himself was a co-laborer with Paul. And of course, the line of thinking and teaching of Paul definitely affected, affected Barnabas. So with Paul's death, however, the Judaizers could attack with vengeance, even to the point of claiming that the Gentile mission had no basis. In other words, the gospel of grace that came through the apostle Paul, including the Gentiles in the plan of salvation, had no basis. So Barnabas needed to prove that Christ was the end of the law. And you'll see this contrast. When you look at Galatians chapter three, you'll see that Paul, when he wrote that particular book, the language there is very similar to this book of Hebrews. One thought here out of Galatians chapter three, when Paul began to write to these Galatians who had come to faith in Christ and then began to come under the influence of these Judaizers who literally were telling them they had to adhere to the Mosaic economy, economy and come back under the law. Paul says to them in Galatians chapter three, verse one, he says, O foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ have been evidently set forth crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, receive ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So faith is the important element in how it is that we come into this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, not by the works of the law. And then he says, are you so foolish having begun in the spirits? In other words, having become the recipients of the grace of God, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? So we hear, we see here the law and grace being contrasted by Paul in Galatians. And so uh, it is the, the understanding from his, uh, historians that Barnabas needed to prove that Christ was the end of the law. What was at stake was whether the, the Gentile mission would be perceived as having a sociological basis or a theological one. If it were merely a sociological basis, then salvation by grace was a fluke. An ingenious concoction of a powerful mind, but now that he was dead, the real gospel of the Judaizers could take root. So now, again, the resurgence of the mosaic economy, again, uh, coming back into Judaism, the influence upon these Gentiles, I mean, the, the Jews who were now convert to, to Christ. Thus, the occasion for the final uh, publication of this epistle was an urgent situation that was facing one of the Jewish house churches. It was a small church, uh, which was in the Lycus Valley. And so this church had already separated themselves from the main body of believers and were beginning to defect back to Judaism. So the influence of both the Judaizers trying to bring these Jewish Christians back into Judaism, and at the same time, another in influence, external influence, which we'll talk about in a minute, which was the influence of the Romans' uh, 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 domain or their power through Nero, upon all Christians, and we'll begin to see how the political influence can have a role to play and how steadfast we remain in Christ. 
And so they were beginning to defect back to Judaism. Far be it from us that we would allow any kind of an influence to cause us to defect back to what God delivered us out, out, out from. The pressure was on, not just the Judaizers, but also from the reports from Rome about Nero's program against Christians. And so you had a religious component of pressure and you had a political component of pressure. Now the historical account of Nero's hatred and persecution of the Christians set the backdrop of the desertion of many of these Hebrew Christians and the climate of religious pressure that caused many to conform back to the old, comfortable, powerless, dead religion. And so these two factors were confronting these Christians during the composition of this letter. And so I wanna look at this account, but I want you to think about this thought here. Uh, we must, we must be people that are non-conformists. And this is what Paul is writing to. He's writing to these Jewish Christians to remind them of what they have espoused to in Christ. And that these religious pressures and these political pressures should not be something that would call them, cause them to defect. So the Christians were persecuted because they espoused a relationship with another king and kingdom. And the reason why they were persecuted by Nero is because Nero had a complex. He was himself a king. And these Christians now were espousing a relationship with a new king and a new kingdom. Now, I would have you to know that the Jews under, the, uh, under, under, uh, under Judaism had no such persecution. They were, they were comfortable under uh, uh, Nero's uh, political influence. They had no persecution, so they could coexist with that political environment. But the mere fact that these Christians espoused to having a king and being part of another kingdom, it caused the theory of Nero to come against them. And so, the Jews who were entrenched in Judaism, dead religion, were in a place of comfort under the Roman authorities. There will be those of the Christian faith, those who profess to be Christians, who will seek comfort and security under the political system of this hour. So when we begin to look at these particular books and we read them, we have to bring ourselves out of the, the first century into the 21st century, how it affected them and then how these same types of influences will affect us if we ourselves are not entrenched in the truths of who Christ is and who we are in him. Now, let me just give you some backdrop about what Nero did to the Christians in 64 AD. A generation after the death of Christ, Christianity had reached Rome in the form of an obscure offshoot of Judaism. So they looked at this sect of Christians as being something that was small, small something that was an offshoot from Judaism. And its influence was mainly on the poor and the destitute. Members of this religious sect spoke of coming to a new kingdom and a new king. These views provoked suspicion among the Jewish authorities. And so of course, you know that the Jews who were espoused to Judaism, as far as they were concerned, their Messiah had not come. So they felt threatened. Therefore, they persecuted what they did not know or have knowledge of. They persecuted the Christians. And so you had a religious influence and you had a political influence. And so these views provoked suspicion among the Jews authorities who rejected the group and fear among the Roman authorities who perceived these sentiments as a threat to the empire. So these new Christians with this new king being part of a new kingdom was a threat to Nero and the Roman empire. Now the Roman mosaic, uh, uh, there are Roman mosaics that show prisoners who were put to death in the arena as part of a festival. And this is what Nero did because these people who espoused a relationship to this King Jesus that were part of a new kingdom, he did this. In the summer of 
64 AD, Rome suffered a terrible fire that burned for six days and seven nights, consuming almost three quarters of the city. And Nero himself, he set this fire, but he blamed the Christians. It, it was his way of using the Christian religion or the Christian sect as a sport. And so the people, uh, the people accused, uh, accused the, 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 the Emperor Nero for disvasting and claiming to set the fire for his own amusement in order to defect these accusations and placate the people, Nero laid blame for the fire on the Christians. So he used the Christians as a scapegoat. The, the emperor ordered the arrest of a few members of the sect who under torture, watch this now, under torture accused others until the entire Christian population was implicated and blamed and became fair game for retribution. So even, even Christians who were lukewarm, who did not have real roots in their life, turned against their own brothers and sisters under the political pressure of that hour. They gave up their brothers and sisters. And as many of the religious sects that could be found were rounded up and put to death in a most horrific manner for the amusement of the citizens of Rome. So think about what was going on while Paul or, again, uh, those who walked alongside of Paul, who used his source material, who wrote to this uh, 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 the, the, the uh, Hebrew uh, Christians, who were about to defect with all of these Christians being put to death, that they were under such pressure. And as a result, the Christians of that hour were literally martyrs under the hands of Nero. And so here's the purpose of the writing of the book. It's agreed that the majority of scholars believe the purpose of this letter was to warn Jewish Christians against apostasy. And so pressure, pressure can become a reason to defect from the press, pre, uh, the, the faith. What kind of pressure? Political pressure. However, this is, our, uh, in our view, is only one of the two purposes for this, this epistle. This is a historical uh, narrative. As we suggest in our in our discussion of the occasion of the authors needed to demonstrate that the Gentile mission and his salvation by grace alone had a theological basis. So the emphasis is that the gospel brought the grace of God to all who would believe. Now along this line, a man by the name of Bill Wellington has, the, has, uh, has demonstrated the influence of Galatians on Hebrews. He points out, for example, one cannot be but struck at how many points his discussion of the relationship between the Abrahamic promises, the Mosaic covenant, and the new covenant parallels, Paul discusses of the same, especially in, in, in Galatians. To be sure, the author of Hebrews is interested, especially in the Levitical portions of the law is a way Paul is not. So Paul did not deal with the Levitical priesthood. He dealt with law versus grace. But in the interpretations, you can see the old covenant related to in various ways is superseded by the new covenant, all right? By the new covenant, he sounds very much like Paul indeed. Witherton goes on to say, that his entire argument, like Paul's, is based on the premise not only that Christ offers something better, but also something that eclipsed the old covenant, as good as it was in its day. One of his concluding questions is, could it be that Hebrews provides for us the earliest example of the interpretations of, uh, uh, of Paul for a later and perhaps different audience, which would be all of 
uh, the Christians that now are. Witherton has clearly touched on something when he says, in our view, Barnabas employed Galatians in the writing of this letter, letter recognizing uh, the consistent arguments. Further, he received help from Apollos. It is said that Apollos was an eloquent speaker, but not only an eloquent speaker, but he understood the Greek language in ways that most of his contemporaries did not. And even it is described here that Paul did not speak this level of Greek language the way that Apollos did. And so the way that it is expressed is more along the thought that it could be Apollos as being one of the writers as well. But not only did Apollos work with Paul much more recently than Barnabas, but he was an eloquent man. Barnabas wrote then to the Jewish house church, which was in danger of defecting from the gospel. And so this particular letter would transcend time. It would speak right down into our time because many are going to be challenged by the uh, uh, religious apathy of this hour uh, to, 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 to literally uh, walk away from the central truths of the gospel. And many are going to be influenced by the political pressures of this hour. So we can use a parallel between then and now. So, but he wrote for the larger audience as well, recognizing the need for a polished written statement of the theolo uh, theological, not just the sociological legitimacy of Paul's gospel. Thus, he attempted to refine Paul's statements about the law, especially with regards to uh, 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 the death of Christ and the intentional, vit uh, the death of Christ, uh, in, in all aspects and with the way that Paul wrote and the vindication of Paul's, uh, the essence of Paul's gospel, his thought. One of the things that makes this twin purpose attractive, indeed virtually compelling, is the fact that the tone is sent under urgent conditions, yet its eloquence seems to deny such urgency, except for a few uh, telltale signs of a definite congregation in view of the body of this epistle, as well as conclude the concluding chapter. There is uh, every evidence that this epistle may have been a sermon in the waiting, and so something that could be built upon. Once these few references were uh, e evaluated from the epistle, it can be seen how much this book was intended as a theological vindication of Pauline theology, theology for a Jewish Christian, for Jewish Christians everywhere. Indeed, in light of both the urgency of the situation of the readers and the beautiful logic of the epistle, it is quite difficult to see how this work could have been composed ad hoc. It was a homily waiting for an occasion. And I uh, uh, it, and here it is said that Peter wrote to the Jews and Paul wrote to the Gentiles, but the composition of this letter being possibly Barnabas and Apollos is their writing to Hebrews, stating primarily that Paul's mission was to Gentiles and Apollos and, and Barnabas also had a mission to the Gentiles. Now here's the thing, the theme of the Hebrews is quite simple. It is the absolute supremacy of Christ, a supremacy which allows no challenge, whether from human or angelic beings. And so you'll see that as we go through this, Christ's ministry is higher than the Mosaic economy or Moses who was a servant in God's house. Jesus being the house builder, you'll see that there's a contrast of Jesus's life and ministry being higher than angels. And then you'll see there's a contrast between Jesus's life being even higher than Abraham's role and Jesus's life and ministry, his priesthood being, being higher than the uh, Aaronic uh, priesthood. So there's an argument being set forth by the writers. 
to Hebrew Christians. So let me just give you this here. In the first section, the theological basis for Christ's superiority involves, I'm gonna give you three or five parts. First, Christ is seen as superior to the Old Testament prophets. That's the first thing. Second, Christ is superior to the angels. Third, Christ is superior to Moses. Why, why does God have to do this? Because if, if he does not do this, just like the Jews of this day, they still espouse more credence to Moses than they do the revelation that Christ has already come. And so angels are just servants used of God. They were used to bring some of the revelation. The prophets are just servants. They were used to bring some of the revelation. What was the revelation? The revelation was about Jesus Christ, him being king, him being Messiah, him being redeemer of all humanity. They were bringing partial revelation. Even Moses, a servant in God's house, he brought partial revelation. Isaiah brought partial revelation. Ezekiel brought partial uh, revelation. All of the prophets only saw in part, but they were talking about the prophet himself, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the King. And so let me give you just a basic outline, and then we're going to jump into this for the next 30 minutes or so. I'm gonna send this to you. I just wanted to do some of the backdrop without trying to go too uh, in depth in it, all right? So, so here's what we're gonna, we're gonna deal with as we go through the book, all right? We're gonna deal with the theological basis of Christ's superiority. That's gonna be all of chapter one, all the way to chapter 10. We're gonna deal with Christ's uh, superiority over prophets. We're gonna deal with that a little bit today. That's chapter one, verse one to four. We're going to deal with God's revelation to the prophets. How did God bring revelation to the prophets? We know that it was through dreams. We know that it was through visions. We know that it was through angelic visitation. And we also know that God himself visited man in scripture. He visited the forefathers. Jesus himself, and I'll show this to you in scripture, Jesus himself showed up as what we may call theologically a theophany. He came in a official capacity as the captain of the host of the armies of God. He showed up himself. And so it's amazing how when you look in the scriptures and you see there's a reference to angels or the angel of the Lord, more specifically, the angel of the Lord. There are angels of God that minister on behalf of God uh, on, uh, um, to intervene in the affairs of human relationships. But there's also reference to the angel of the Lord. And there we begin to see that that is Jesus himself who shows up in the scriptures in his com uh, official capacity as the captain of the host of the armies of the Lord. All right, he was not showing up as redeemer yet. But you'll see how God, you know, in his infinite wisdom and knowledge, being almighty, can do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. Amen. All right. And so then we'll see, uh, to the revelation of the son. We'll see the uh, Christ is superior to the angels. We'll see that demonstrated from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Then we'll deal with a warning in chapter two. This is a warning to that then church but it's the warning to all this of Christendom throughout all generations. The first warning is don't drift back. In other words, don't go back to what's comfortable. That could be said of us, just like this Jewish house church uh, had the tendency or the desire or the propensity to drift back to Judaism. The warning is Christ is all sufficient. He is all you and I need. Don't drift back, all right? Let me give you uh, the second warning that we'll deal with is a warning to don't defect. And we'll deal with that in chapter three, uh, verse uh, uh, six, all the way to chapter four of verse 13. And there's many other components under that, but let me give you the third warning. It says, don't degenerate, don't degenerate, all right? And we'll deal with that in all of chapter five. There are many things underneath that. I'll send this to you. 
And then the fourth warning is don't despise, don't despise. And we'll begin to break that down and dealing with that in chapter 10. And then the fifth warning is don't deny. So we'll begin to look at each one of these things and see how in a practical sense, all of this can apply to us right now. So remember that Christ, Christ's superiority is the, the theme, the central theme to this particular book. Now I wanna to begin to deal with for about the next half an hour or so, I wanna to begin to deal with Hebrews chapter one, verse one to two, all right? And I wanna put a little theme to it right here, is the voice of God in the last days through his son to his sons and daughters. This is going to be very important to you and I because through the successive ages, God was building revelation about his redemptive plan through his son. Everything that was written was literally written about the son here a little, there a little. As the spirit of a living God used the prophets, they prophesied only in part about the revelation and each prophet had a part of the picture. They were building a full picture of the redemptive work of Christ Jesus himself. And so the picture had to come into full manifestation by the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. So he himself would become the full revelation or the final word of all of the prophets. What they were speaking about, he himself would become the fulfillment. And so in an appointed time, God sent forth his son born of a woman, and then him, he himself would begin to speak for himself. He would no longer need the prophets to speak for him. He would begin to speak for himself. He would take center stage and he would begin to herald the mind and will and the intention of the father himself. So now that the consummation of all that was spoken about about the son had arrived, he now became the primary voice. He needed no one else to speak for him. And this day and hour, he is speaking for himself. So on the premise of that, we come to this particular uh, juncture in the beginning of this book. And this is why I believe the Lord gave me this particular thing, the voice of God in the last days through his son to his sons and daughters. We must without question be able to recognize the son's voice. His voice must become the primary voice that we distinguish above and beyond all voices. It is detrimental to our to our survival, our victory, and our ability to navigate this particular time uh, uh, prophetically. In the last days, notice, it is the last days that God is speaking to his son, through his son, to us, his people. So in the TPT, it says, I'll read King James and the TPT. It says, through our history, Throughout history, God has spoken to our ancestors by his prophets in many different ways. So God used the prophets to speak to our ancestors, but he did it in a diverse measure of ways. Uh, uh, not only did God use the prophets, but God himself would visit our ancestors in dreams, uh, in visions, uh, through the agency of angels, he would release angels to bring messages to them. But what God is saying to you and I now, there are prophets that are speaking, that are prophesying, but when it comes to the inspiration of scripture, all that was being said, God used them for them, for, used them for that then, but now the one who is the eternal Logos, the one who is the living word, the one who is the speaking word, he has shown up himself. He is now speaking for himself. 
when it comes to scripture, when it comes to the revelation of God, the revelation that God wanted to make known to man, the measure of that is the word of the living God. Any deviation from that makes it non and void. And so the true measure of God's will is his word. And Jesus is the will of God. Jesus is the word of God. And so through our, our history, God has spoken to our ancestors by his prophets in many different ways. The revelation he gave them was only a fragment at a time. Here a little, there a little. Building one truth upon another. But notice the language in this next verse. But to us living in these last days, we are living in the last days. God now speaks to us openly in the language of a son. The appointed heir of everything whom these prophets were talking about and through him God created the panorama of all things in all time. The King James says it this way, God who in sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, by his son whom he have appointed heir to all things by whom he also made the world, the world. So God spoke to our fathers. God spoke to our fathers. So we have to look back in scripture and see how it is that God spoke, how God brought revelation to our fathers. And so I want to use this Genesis account here in Genesis chapter 18. Genesis 18, verse 15, really quickly. Genesis 18, 1 through 15, I want to share this account here. All right, it says, and the Lord appeared. Notice, notice, I want you to get this now. This is Abraham, our father, our father of faith, right? We are, if, if you be Christ, then you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So God spoke to our fathers. I want to show you one of the ways he did that. In, a, in, in Genesis chapter 18, verse 1 to 15, says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of memory, and he sat in a tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by. Notice the language, the Lord appeared, right? So we see that God himself, the Lord, Jesus himself, appeared to Abraham. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them at the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant, let a little water, I pray thee, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that, ye shall pass on. So Abraham is inviting the Lord and his visitors to stay right there in his house. He's going to uh, uh, be, um, he's going to take care of them. For therefore are ye come, he says, he says, therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine flour, knead them and make cakes of the hearth. And Abraham went unto the herd and fetched the calf tender and good and gave it to the young man and he haste to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf and he dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them and he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. And they said unto him, where is Sarah, thy wife? Now watch this now. God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. I want to say this to you. Watch this now. I want you to see the chief prophets show up in the old covenant. Watch this now. Wherefore, he says, where is Sarah, thy wife? 
And he said, behold in the tent. And he said, I certainly, what's the prophecy? And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. This is a prophecy. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent, which was behind him. And now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord, notice this thing, and the Lord said unto Abram, Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child, which, of, uh, which am an old man? And then he says, is there anything too hard for the Lord? And the time, at the time appointed, I will. Notice he said, notice how, how he's talking. I will. This is, this is emphatic. I will. So this is the Lord. At the time appointed, I will return to thee according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not. For she was afraid. And she said, nay but thou didst laugh. And so we see now that Jesus himself showed up in the times of Abraham. He showed up in official capacity as the Lord of the hosts of the armies of God. Why? Because there are two men with him. The two men are two angels. They're about to go to Sodom and Gomorrah and to destroy it. And Abraham then begins to intercede before the Lord because God says, shall I hide anything? The Lord says, shall I hide anything from Abraham, my servant? I must tell him what I'm about to do. And so Abraham stands in the gap on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah because Lot and his family is there and he intercedes. And of course, Lot's family is saved. So Jesus shows up in the old covenant and intervenes on behalf of Abraham's intercession. But he prophesies to Sarah about Isaac, the baby that she's going to have. And so I, I wanted to show you that Jesus himself is the prophet. Moses is a prophet. I, uh, uh, um, Isaiah is a prophet. Ezekiel is a prophet. Jeremiah is a prophet. Uh, Ezekiel is a prophet. Micah is a prophet. Malachi is a prophet. But Jesus is the prophet. Amen. So there's a comparison. So now when we look at the book of Hebrews, there's a contrast of Jesus being superior. So him being God, he can do whatever he wants to do, however he wants to do. So he shows up and he has an encounter with Abraham. I'm not going to read this. I'll just talk about it. Jacob, we know the story of Jacob. Jacob wrestled with a man. It is said that Jacob wrestled with an angel. Jacob did not wrestle with an angel. In the dream, he had an encounter with the Lord. And so the Lord speaks to Jacob. He, in this encounter, it's in, in, it's in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 32, you know it. But there, he has an encounter with Jesus. Jesus shows up. We know about that. Moses had an encounter with God in the burning bush. It says, when you read the caption in, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 to 6, it says the angel of the Lord. I want you to remember this. The angel of the Lord. All right. When the reference to the angel of the Lord, capital A, angel, it is a reference to a the theophany. It is Jesus showing up himself. All right. So watch this. I'm sharing this because we're dealing with the superiority of Jesus Christ. In Exodus chapter three, verse one to six. Watch this now. Now, now Moses kept the flock of Jephro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, 
And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. Notice it says the angel of the Lord in the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, who? The Lord. That's why I want you to use this differentiation between angels and the angel of the Lord. Because in the old covenant, God had to show up in a form that was palatable for man's experience. The raw essence of God, no man could, could, could handle. It would destroy him. But we'll see in, in some instances, even when, when, when Moses was on the mountain, he had that encounter with God and God gave him the oracles and, and, and Moses cried out and he says, I, I wanna see your glory. And God says, I can't show you my glory. You know, so he so he 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 put his hand out, you know, and 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 covered covered uh, Moses so he could pass by, and only Moses could see his hinder part. That was God's raw glory. No man could see him in his glory and live. But this is God showing up, burning bush. It first says the angel of the Lord, and then it says, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, this is how God spoke to our fathers. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Why, this is God's glory manifested. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Remember this account because this is the bush burning. This is God's manifested glory. Uh, uh, God is talking to, to, to Moses. Uh, he tells Moses that the place where he's standing is holy ground. Remember that. All right. This is more he said, I am the God of thy father. So God is saying to him, this is not an angel encounter. This is me. I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. All right. Now, let's go to let's go to, to Joshua real quick. Joshua chapter five. I'm only using this premise because in Hebrews chapter one, it says, King James, and God who in sundry times and in diverse manners spake to uh spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets so the diverse manners is what i'm dealing with right now okay and uh, uh, joshua had an encounter with the lord just before his entry into jericho or the fall of jericho in joshua chapter 5 verse 13 through uh 15 notice the language it's similar to what we just read and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and, and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. Notice the man has a sword. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, here it is but as the captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? The captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? He is standing in official capacity as the captain of the host of the armies of the Lord. You know, when I was thinking about this, I thought about the military, uh, uh, Complement how the military is strategically designed that each military uh, uh, branch or rank has a general, a general that oversees operations, but then we have a president who is called the commander in chief. He doesn't have the capacity to literally uh, uh, 
He doesn't have to be involved in every military operation, but he can show up any military, a war a, a theater in a capacity, uh, uh, an official capacity, capacity as the, as the, uh, um, he can show up as the commander in chief. Well, that's the same thing with Jesus. Jesus showed up in his official capacity here uh, right before the fall of Jericho. And it says, and he says, nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord am I come, and Joshua fell on his face, once he said that, and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what saith my Lord unto his servant. Now, I want to say this because angels cannot be worshipped. Remember that. Angels cannot be worshipped. Only God is there, there's a there's a scribe worship only to God. And so the moment when Joshua fell to his knees and began to worship, he was acknowledging that he was before the Lord. So when you read the scripture and you see this, you see Jesus showing up himself in an official capacity. He says, and the captain of the Lord of hosts said unto Joshua, the same thing that was said to Moses. He says, loose thy shoes from off thy foot for the place wherein thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. So this was God showing up himself, Jesus showing up himself. Now, again, I only did that just to show you the diverse ways that God interacted with the fathers of old in the diverse manners, all right? He spoke to prophets, but he showed up himself, all right? Now, let me just shift gears because the last part of what I'm teaching here today is to bring the emphasis on our uh, attention to how important the voice of the Lord is in our lives, all right? Notice in Matthew chapter 17, verse five, and this is the father himself. He says, and this is, this is what the father says of his son. While he yet spake, behold, a brown cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud. So God would show up in the cloud. He did in the Old Testament. He did in the New Testament as well, which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now, as you remember, Jesus went to the mount of what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. Elijah and Moses shows up. I gave you the revelation behind that. That is a prophetic uh, imagery of two dispensations coming to an end where Moses being a prophet of a different sort, he is, he is a prophet that's unlike any other prophet. As, 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 as powerful as God used Elijah with all of the different miracles that God did through Elijah, Moses is a prophet of a different class because it is said of Moses that God, that he spoke to God face to face and that he himself was the mouthpiece of God in the earth. He was of a different class. And so now at the close of the old covenant age, God is now speaking and inaugurating the primary voice that is to be heard now is his son. And again, he says, while they yet spake, behold, a cloud, a bright cloud overshadowed them and behold a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased hear ye him. Now, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8 to 10. Again, remember what we're saying, that all of the prophets that God used, they only had a part of the revelation. And this is what I'm using this verse for. It says, prophecy 
and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. This is the comparison I'm drawing of the old covenant prophecies. Their knowledge was partial and incomplete. And even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. And that's what God the Father was doing by the Spirit of God through the prophets to bring the revelation of Jesus Christ, his redemptive work. They were only speaking in part. But when the time of perfection comes and the full picture showed up in the person of Jesus Christ, these partial things will become useless. We do not need a partial picture when the full picture has arrived. Jesus Christ is the full revelation of God to us. So Jesus is the fulfillment of all prophetic voices over the ages and the prophets was brought partial revelations throughout history. Their voices were significant in the total fulfillment of God's plan, but the son now speaks with full rights to the disclosure of the father's plan because he is its fulfillment. In other words, he has full authority to speak in first person. Jesus now, or better yet, the father now speaks in the son. The father now speaks in the son. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. So the father's voice is now heard in the son. And so the son is now speaking on behalf of the father. Other words, God in past, uh, in other words, for God in the past, God's intention was to bring uh, redemption to mankind through his son, but Jesus represents God's final word to humanity. He is the final word. He is the full revelation. He is the final and complete disclosure of the revelation of the fathers, uh, of the fathers, which was released over thousands of years. They spoke about his voice. Now his voice is the final voice the father is speaking through in the last days. He is the prophet of all prophets. He is the fulfillment of all they spoke in part. part. Now his voice takes center stage in the last days. He now speaks for himself. The father is speaking directly to us in the son and that's why it's important for us to understand christ must become superior to all things because there are many voices in the world and there are many things that are speaking to us and we must understand and recognize his voice above all voice let me make this statement it is not that we are not hearing the lord speak in this hour it is a question of, are we obeying what he is saying? I'm going to say it again. You know, it, it, it's so powerful. You know, and, and, and with, in our humanity, I want to break this down very practically. In our humanity, we're always saying, God, I want to hear you. I want, you know, I just want to be able to recognize what you're saying. And God is speaking. God is speaking to us all the time in so many different ways. It's just a question of, Will we recognize and will we obey what he is saying when he says it? We know his voice. Why? Because the Bible says, my sheep know my voice. We know his voice. I'm sitting downstairs this morning. I'm at the computer and I'm about to print these documents out. And the spirit of the Lord speaks to me. He says, that plant sitting in the other room is thirsty. It has no water. And I said, I'm not going to do nothing else. I heard it. I got up 
And I didn't have to really look into the thing to see if it was dry. The Lord spoke. He spoke clearly. He said, that plant up there is thirsty. That thing was bone dry. He said to me before I could get up, he said, if you don't go water that plant, it's going to die. I got up and I went and got a bottle of water and I watered that plant. God speaks all the time. Remember the still small voice? We know God's voice and we need to know it more, uh, more, more distinctly in this hour than any other voice. He's speaking to us. So hear me now. It is not that we are not hearing the Lord when he's speaking this hour. It is a question of, are we obeying what he says? Here's another thought. I'm almost done. I'm going to give you five things after this and I'm going to close out. All right. And then we're going to pray. We always expect a prophetic word from the Lord about a spectacular future. We, we don't want to hear. We want to hear something grand. We want to hear something grand. God, can you tell me something grand that's going to help me through this season? But watch this is what the Lord said to me. But if we obey what the Lord says in the immediate, it creates a spectacular future. I'm going to say it again. We always expect a prophetic word from the Lord about a spectacular future. But if we obey what the Lord says in the immediate, it creates a spectacular future. My sheep know my voice. How is God speaking to us in these last days? He is speaking to us through his son. Now, I want to give you five practical ways that God is speaking to us, albeit these are not an exhaustive list. There are many things that could be included because in our walk with the Lord, in our varying, uh, varying degrees of relationship with the Lord, they're different with each one of us, but God has revealed certain things to each one of us, how he how we relate to him, how he relates to us. Now, number one, God speaks through the scripture. The primary way that we're going to hear the Lord Jesus Christ speak to us in this hour is through the word. This is very practical. The Bible gives a great deal of guidance on things we encounter in life. So familiarity with his teachings can result in the right verse and message coming to mind just when we need it. God speaks through messages. You know, oftentimes I'm talking to people, I'll, I'll call, you know, just like this week, I call my, my youngest sister and I'm having a conversation with her, just having a conversation. And at the end of the, 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 the conversation, she said, you know what? <clears throat> God just spoke to me. I had a sense that I wasn't just wrangling on. I had a sense that God was putting things on my heart just to say to her. But that's how God speaks. That's how the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to us. Oftentimes, God will speak to us while someone else is talking to us. And so uh, uh, get familiar, you know, his voice comes through teaching. His, his voice will come to us through a message. His voice will come to us through a verse. That's one of the ways. So we, we, we must give ourselves to the scripture because that's where Jesus speaks the loudest. I'm going to say it again. We must give ourselves to the scripture because that's where Jesus speaks to us the loudest. His, vo his voice is louder there. Number two, God speaks through our intuition. The inward witness. When I say intuition, intuition, it means the inward witness. You, you, you just got a feeling about something. Watch this now. This is a combination of our thoughts and a gut feeling. Well, what it is, is God's thoughts registering on our thoughts. It can be thoughts and feelings that come to us doing prayer or quietness or waiting or just busyness whenever you're doing something. Oftentimes God speaks to me when I'm doing something. Or it can come out of the blue, just out of nowhere, thought. It takes practice to discern which things are messages from God and which things are just wishful thinking. Put it that way. It could be just you. You got to be able to distinguish your voice from the Lord's voice. 
Number three, I said it before and I included it in the first statement, God speaks through others. I, 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 my God, you know, thank God for the saints of God. But the thing that intrigues me most often is when I know somebody ain't saved and they start talking and I hear the voice of God. You know, it just lets me know in those instances how much God really loves me, that he's going through great lengths. Listen, if he can use a donkey to speak to Balaam, he can use an unsaved person to speak to you and I. The question is, will we be prideful and say, you know, this person is all in themselves, da, 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 da. No. When we hear our father's voice, we don't even have to tell the person that, you know, God spoke. It's that we recognize inwardly God is speaking to us. So God speaks to others. Sometimes this is the hardest to recognize. We should be careful not to prejudge who God might use to deliver a message when we need to hear it. Number four, God speaks through books. Uh, you know, we read books all the time and, and, and as we inspirational books and there God begins to speak to us. God speaks through letters, movies. Oftentimes, I mean, I can... I can, I, can, I can watch a movie, man, and there it is, God speaking to me. God speaks through music. You put on a certain praise song, and all of a sudden, right there in the song are the words that you need for that moment. It is Jesus speaking directly to you. God speaks in dreams. God speaks in visions. And the last one here, number five, God speaks through circumstances. Oh, if, if, if the inward voice we, 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 we shunned or we didn't obey, if God sent somebody to talk to us, we didn't obey it. Um, <laughs> if, if all of the different areas in which I've already given you, when all else, else has failed, if we haven't heeded the voice of God, God will allow your circumstances to speak to you. And sometimes the guidance from God comes from doors closing. You know, what is God saying when you when you you're pressing up against something? You just you know, in your heart, you says, "Does God desire uh, for you to do a certain thing or to, to be a certain place or to accomplish a certain thing?" But the timing is not right. You just feel like doors are slamming. It can be the will of God for you, but that door slamming is God talking to you, saying, "Not now." We have to recognize that. You know what I mean? Uh, at other times it comes in the form of opportunities, opportunities that are, that are put before you. God is saying, this is the time. This is a yes. We should be open to the possibility that God either might, it, it might be a message from the Lord. Now, this is what I want to do as we close out right here. Remember Hebrews chapter one, verse one and two. God who in sundry times and in diverse matters spake in time past Unto the fathers by the prophets. That's how he spoke to them. If he wanted to get something across to them, he used a prophet. He used the vision. He used the dream. He used an angel to bring a message. They are ministering service sent forth to minister on behalf of those who are the heirs of salvation. God can and does send angels. The Bible tells us not to be careful to entertain angels because doing so, we're doing it unaware. Uh, Many of us have had angelic visitation and we're not aware of it, but that was God intervening in our life. But most often God will not send an angel to you to get a message to you because he is now speaking to you through the son, by the spirit. He speaks to you by his word. He don't want us to, to, to be looking for visions, to be looking for dreams, to be looking for angelic visitation to get a word from him because he's given us his word. And so we're to understand how God is speaking in these last days. He's speaking to us in and through his son. So with that being said, I'm closing out with these last three verses. And then we're going to pray. It is a prayer for hearing ears, hearing ears. As I said before, it's not that God is not speaking. The question is, are we obeying what God is saying? And Proverbs chapter 20, verse 12 says, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord have made even both of them. So God has made the seeing eyes and the hearing ears. If God made your ears, he's made them primarily, number one, to hear his voice. 
And so we're going to be praying over our ears, not just natural ears, but inner ears. Revelation chapter 2, verse 29, we know this. It says, he that have an ear, and surely we have two. He that have an ear, and it's not just talking about natural ears. It's talking about inner ears, hearing, understanding. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So we have the capacity to hear what Jesus is saying to us by his Spirit. And then in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4, this is what it says. The Lord God have given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. The B clause is what I want you to get. He waketh me, he waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. Now I want to share that out of the Amplified Bible. I love the way it is, it is put there in the Amplified. Isaiah 50. Verse 4. Here's what it says. The Lord have given me his servant, the tongue of disciples, as one who is taught that I may know how to sustain the weary with the word. And I love this is the B clause. He wakes me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple, as one who is taught. The Lord God has opened my ear. Verse five, the first part of that clause. The Lord God has opened my ear. And I want us to pray. I want you to, I want you to put your hands over your ears right now. And we're going to pray a very simple prayer. And we're going to believe God that the voice of the Lord is going to become so much more clear and distinct above all the noise, all that disrupts and distracts, all the multiple diverse voices that we hear, that his voice will become so much more clearer. His guidance, his direction, his instruction will become so much more clearer to discern. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, that in time past, you spoke to the prophets. You, put, you spoke through the prophets to the fathers in many different ways. But you said in these last days, you are speaking to us through your son. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that we are in the last days. And we thank you that we have capacity to hear the good shepherd's voice. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice for our families. Help us, Lord, to, to hear your voice and to receive your instruction and guidance, Lord, for our careers, for our marriages, for our children, for our vocations, for our businesses. Lord, for, for, for every situation that confronts us, our, our finances, Lord. What we're to do day by day, Lord, where we're to be at the precise time and moment. Father, how we're to confront the issues of this hour, the political pressures of this hour, the religious apathy of this hour. Lord, we are nonconformists. We will not conform, even as uh, uh, the writers of this book, Lord, were warning these Jewish Christians not to defect, not, not to drift back, not, 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 not to cower down, not, not, not to defect, Lord God, and to, 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 to move away from the revelation that they have received. Lord, may it be said of us that Jesus will become so superior to everything that confronts us, Lord, that nothing will shake us, nothing will unnerve us, nothing will move us, 
Father, we thank you right now for an inward circumcised decision of the ears. God, we thank you in the name of Jesus that we will recognize your voice. Not only will we recognize your voice, Father, but we will heed your voice. We thank you, Lord. Loose, open our ears to hear as a well-trained disciple of Christ. You said the voice of the stranger, we will not follow. People are running here, they're running there. They're cowering, Lord God, under the many threatening and, and tormenting and, and fear-mongering voices of this hour. We will not conform. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord for precision in hearing your voice in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for it. And we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.